If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. Giles Brandreth is a writer, broadcaster, television presenter, and former Member of Parliament. In 2023, he interviewed me in London. He's an urbane and charming gentleman, and we had a very nice, frank, mostly autobiographical conversation. The recording is here, sound only. My guest today is a scientist, an evolutionary biologist, who has become world famous, really, as the author of The Selfish Gene. He also became controversial, as well as even more famous, as an outspoken atheist when he wrote The God Delusion. I'm intrigued by him because I love words and language, and I think he's the person who coined the word meme for the first time. So there you are. He's in the dictionary. And now he's with me at the Grosvenor House Hotel, where we happen to meet, and we talked about Richard's childhood, his school days in Africa, and then at boarding school in England, where he and I actually had a, a similar experience because we were both groped by um, one of the teachers at our different schools and uh, I think responded to it as maybe people of our generation would and did. Anyway, he intrigued me and he surprised me in many ways. So you're going to be having a conversation or listening into a conversation with a remarkable man and one of the most brilliant scientists of our age. So you may not understand everything. I didn't. Richard, can we begin by me asking you quite simply, what is your very, very first memory? Interestingly, my first two memories are sort of related. The first one is getting an injection. Uh, must have been at the age of one and a half or so from uh, Dr. Trim in Kenya. Kenya, we called it then. And the second one is getting injected by a scorpion um, a little bit later, and, and those are my first two memories. You were born in Kenya? Yes. My father was a colonial service in what was then Nyasalam, now Malawi, and uh, he was called up to, to join the army, and that meant going to Nairobi and then touring around various places, getting trained, and then finally... And who were your parents? I mean, that's your father. Who was your mother? Uh, my mother, uh, her name was uh, Jean Ladner, and um, she was an artist... And I recently discovered a poet, actually. Uh, she um, wrote some beautiful poems which the philosopher Anthony Grayling kind of discovered and persuaded me to publish in a very slim volume, um, which, uh, which is delightful. I was, uh, unfortunately, she died, a couple of, she died at the age of 102, a couple of years too early to know that she was a published poet. Well done. Well, she clearly had good genes if she lived so long. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come on to that maybe a little bit later. So this, what year is this? I was born in 1941. And does the war affect your parents and life in Africa at that time? Uh, yes, in the sense that my father was called away from his job and to go and join the army and um, uh, was fighting the Italians in, in Abyssinia, uh, some, Somalia. Um, I think he had a comparatively easy war. I mean, I think the Italians were not such formidable adversaries as the Germans or Japanese. And, and um, so, but, but... Yeah. And are you an only child? No, I have a sister three years younger. Fine. So here we are, early 1940s. What age are you being injected and why are you being injected? Oh, I've, I don't know why. I mean, there must have been plenty of reason to be injected. There are all sorts of possible diseases one could get, but I, I don't know what the particular one was. And the scorpion? Um... Yes, well, that, that's the subject of a, con a conflict between my mother's memory and mine. Um, my memory is that I saw this creature scuttling across the floor, thought it was a lizard, which is just, I'm not a very good zoologist, and um, thought it would be rather fun if I put my foot in the way of it, see if it would crawl over my foot, my bare foot, which it, instead it stung me. Um, my mother's recollection is I got down from the table and trod on it, but, and those are completely incompatible memories, and false memory syndrome is a real thing, and, and one or other of us must have a false memory there. You call it false memory syndrome. It's very relevant 
to this conversation and indeed all the conversations I have with people about their early memories, because many of mine, I think, are coloured by a photograph album that my parents kept. And if you ask me about first memories, I often describe actually what I've seen later in a photograph. You're, you're remembering the photograph rather than the actual memory itself. And I, I think in general, we may be remembering memories of memories of memories rather than actually the, the, the event itself. Explain that a bit, unpack that. Well, um, if you keep remembering something, then you're kind of rehearsing it in your mind. And so you've, you've as it were, almost obliterated the original me- memory and just substituted it with a kind of record of the record of the record. And apart from that, you have no real recollections of Kenya because you moved to Malawi, all That's your memories right, of yes, Malawi. almost none. I, I, I vaguely remember a, a, a hut which my mother built for us to, to live in and while my father was, was going around from camp to camp. So, what are your early memories then of Malawi? What's your first memory of...? Um, seeing a very large spider um, and my father kind of freaking out... Um, um, and um, ch- chasing after it. Um, that was, I suppose, my earliest memory of Malawi. And what are your first memories of them as people? Were they warm people? Was very it- warm, um, yes. Uh, I had a very happy childhood. I had wonderful parents and uh, sent away to boarding school, but that's not the matter. Did they have staff? Were there servants? Oh, yes. I mean, are they part that, of your early that, memories? That was normal. And, mm. and so in, in some ways I had a rather anachronistic childhood, rather like a... I suppose an Edwardian childhood in Britain, um, and and with you know cook, cook and gardener and and can you picture them in your head? Were they important to you as a little yes? Boy? I mean, especially one Ali who was who was as it were my, I suppose he was my sort of nanny in a way. I mean, he looked after me all the time, and and um, he was he became my father's batman in the war as well. Well, I had a, a male nanny first of all because I was born later in the forties in Germany. My father after the war was stationed in Germany. And my first nanny was an out-of-work clown. (laughs) And apparently there wasn't much call for circuses in Germany immediately after the war. And so they were... And so I I learnt, when I was a tiny little boy, from my nanny to walk the tightrope and stand on my head. Um, How wonderful. And standing on my head I can still do. And walking the tightrope I found very useful when I was a member of Parliament. (laughs) Yes, I can imagine. What was the first school you went to? It was called Eagle. It was a very English-type boys' prep school founded by an ex-housemaster of the Dragon School in Oxford who went out to sort of seek his fortune in Africa and founded a kind of scion of the Dragon School. It, it was very small, but it had the same motto as the Dragon School and the same school song and, and the same custom of calling the masters by their nicknames to their faces, which I think is rather a nice custom. Which, which yes, what was the headmaster called? He had a Tank. Good, Tank. Mm. And you called him Tank? Yes, even when he was beating me, you called him Tank. <laughs> and it was a school where there was corporal punishment? Well, in, in a very mild way. I mean, uh, um, the, the latest school I went to, there was rather more corporal punishment. My parents sought out a school where there wasn't, for my prep school, where there wasn't corporal punishment. Good for them. Not even the slipper. Yes. Uh, the headmaster was called Bocky. Don't ask me why, but we... we to were, his face? To his face. We were allowed to call him Bucky. OK. I don't remember much about him, but I do remember the first advice, well, the only advice he ever gave me when I was eight or nine. He said, Brandreth, yes, sir, busy people are happy people. Remember that. It was interesting. Yes. Well, in fact, here I am, 70 years later, and I still remember it. Yes, yes. Uh, and still and, busy. And, and still being busy. I mean, were there any teacher, was, did Tank give you advice? I'm sure he did. I don't remember what it was. And was your school like mine with a, a mixture of some very eccentric teachers, some good teachers, some oddities who who threw chalk at you and books at you? Yes, that's right. Um, not not that I don't. I was only there for one or two terms actually. But later on, yes, literally throwing things. Um, what was your next school then? Well, my next school was Chaffin Grove in Salisbury. I'm thinking oh. of Arundel, where I went at the age of thirteen, where, where my form master, who was a delightful man. Um, but he had a temper which he knew about. And so he would say um, something like, I'm warning you, it's coming. Get down below your desk, it's coming. I'm warning you, I can't stop it. I'm warning you, get down below your desk. And then he would start hurling um, everything in sight at, at the offending boy. And then the next day he would offer the most charming apology. Well, I had a teacher like that who threw things and another one 
who would make you stand against the wall and he would then fall towards you and just at the last minute he would split his hands so the hands didn't hit your face. It Did you have to catch him? Uh, no, you had to dare. You had yes. to stare him out yes, okay. and not flinch. The yes. idea was not to flinch. But one of the other punishments was somebody did something wrong. We weren't quite clear who it was. You all had to stand in the gymnasium in lines, and if anyone moved, another minute was added. So everyone was penalised? Everyone was penalised, unless mm. the guilty party said, I am the guilty party. But we all stood together. Yes. To not to. Yes. That was because we were throwing butter pats uh, at the portrait of the founder of the school. Because uh, we had little white butter pats, and on a knife, we'd flick them up. What school is that? This was a school. They've changed its name since some of the staff were arrested. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a slight exaggeration. Only one of them should have been arrested, and he wasn't. He was one of those regular um, holding your knee types. Did you have, you had some of that? A little bit, yes. Yeah. It was, I mean, in a sense, it, it's, I think, perhaps difficult for people of our generation to talk about this because it was so commonplace. Yes. But I think we took it in our stride. Well, we did, and, and I've had a, come in for a lot of stick for, for saying that we took it in our stride. Me too. Mm. I did a, a childhood memoir and wrote an account. You know, not didn't milk it, but an account of, of you know, the, the, the master who did prey on some of the boys. And I remember being interviewed on the radio about it, and the interviewer sort of hushed his voice and sort of mm. leant forward. Yes. Um, and, and after the interview, the producer, I, mean, I was then in my late 60s or early 70s, the producer said, oh, you know, we have a duty of care, are you all right? And I said, well, I'm just recounting something <laughs> about 65 years ago. I have survived, and I did survive at the time. But I think they thought, and I wasn't trivialising it, I was just writing an account of what had happened uh, at the time. But people, their sensitivities, how are you about judging the well, past? Well, what, what, what I feel about that is that um, if those of us who suffered a very mild an encounter of this sort had claimed that it was tra traumatising us for the rest of our lives, somebody who really was assaulted in a violent way by a priest or something like that, I mean, really horrible day after day, week after week, they could say, how dare you make a fuss about what happened to you? How dare you diminish what happened to me? Do you get the point? I totally get yeah. the point. Yes. Mine was, in fact, the choir master, and it did go on for a, a couple of years. I mean, I, it was interesting enough, I was rather flattered by it at the time. Um, and I see now it's completely wrong, reprehensible. The tactic in those days when the school found out about it uh, I think the police were called in, but because there was no evidence, because I wouldn't give any evidence, uh, he went away and went to teach at a girls' school where I think he was considered less of a risk. Uh, now, you know, uh, he would be in prison. In prison, yes. Um, and, in fact, I didn't reveal his name until after he had died uh, because I didn't, I didn't want to go through all that. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about it because it obviously is serious. And the fact that I'm still thinking about it and you... I imagine you've written about it in one of your... I memoirs. have written about it, yes. Um, uh, he, he committed suicide, the, the, my, my one, in the end, when, when he was found out. Yeah. And he was, he was sacked and then, and then committed suicide. And how do you feel about that? Well, I, I mean, it was quite traumatic at the time. The suicide was, was rather traumatic. Yeah. And, of course, the very fact that we remember them and able to talk about it, and it's quite vivid in my head, shows that it has affected one's life in some way. It's part of the story. Yes. Where are you on the broader issue of, in the 2020s, judging people and things? I mean, you were born in the 1940s in Africa. Where, where are you on judging the past by today's standards? I think we've got to be, take the sort of view that sensible historians do, that the past is, is different. And, and um, uh, it, it, I mean... I wouldn't for a moment um, defend the sort of cushy life that, in a way that we had with, with servants and things, but it, it was part of the time. Let's get back to what we're supposed yes. to be talking about, which is your early memories. What was the first subject at school you liked? Um, I mean, we did, we did Latin, oddly enough. We did French. We did mathematics, which I was rather bad. Um, I was rather good at Latin, and when I went to my next school in England, um, I was rather ahead of them, ahead of my 
fellows. Um, slightly surprisingly, having been to school in Africa. But, but I mean, I, I used to pretend not to know things that I did know because, because I, f- I felt that if you were too much of a sort of swat, you'd be unpopular. So I would, I would pause and stammer before giving the answer to the question, pretending it was difficult for me, which it wasn't. Were you a liked boy? I wasn't disliked. I wasn't neither, really. I mean, I'm neither very, very liked or disliked. Did you stand out from the crowd, do you think, at your schools? Not at all, no. Were you good at sport? No, hopeless. So here you are, sent to England, and when you come to England, are your parents still in Africa? No, no, they oh, came... The whole they, family comes... They, yes, my parents um, came on leave from Africa, thinking they were going to go back, but um, my father had a couple of years earlier inherited a farm in England um, and had never thought to actually go there. It was on a long lease uh, to somebody who they were told as the ship docked in London, he had died. And therefore the possibility opened up that they could actually leave Africa and move to England to the family farm, which had been in the family since I think 1726 or something. Um, and um, so after a lot of agonising, they eventually decided to, to leave Africa, surprisingly, and, and settle in England. So I was therefore taken out of the, my Africa school and sent to school in England instead. And, and we, we, we completely moved from Africa to England. So here you are at school, doing OK. Do you feel exceptional at all? You say you, you, weren't, uh, you weren't, didn't stand out from the ground, but in your head, did you feel you were exceptional? No, I, 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 no, I didn't, no. I certainly wasn't. Oh. So when did you become exceptional? When's the, when's the first... Did you have ever... Have you ever had a eureka moment? What was your first moment in your life? It may have come much later. I'm not sure about a eureka moment. I think I... Um, my f- Probably my second year at Oxford, I suppose I suddenly... Not suddenly. I, I, I realised that education is not like school. Uh, and it's not a matter of mugging up facts. It's a matter of thinking and taking an original position, thinking things through. I mean, the Oxford tutorial where you, where you have to write an essay um, in, in zoology, when, when I did it at least, the sort of essay topics you were given often had a controversial aspect to them. You had to read, go into the library and read the original literature, not, not textbooks, you had to read the original research literature and um, write an essay, perhaps forming a, an opinion about a controversial topic. And that was a heady experience for an 18 year old, 19 year old. So you leave school, you've got A levels, but you don't go to Oxford to do zoology, right? do you? Go do something else? Well, I, I, I applied to read biochemistry, and thank goodness they turned me down for that and said, you, you can come if you read zoology. And I said, yes. And that would have been a disastrous decision. I'm very, very glad that, that they took that decision for me. Which college did you apply to? Balliol. And was that a family tradition? Yes. And how many of you had been to Balliol before? I believe 11. Very good. Mm. So this is quite a, a privileged upbringing. A, a, a yes, child of empire I have to admit to, it, was, it was a privileged upbringing. And you went to this good public school, you get yes. your A-levels, you're middle of the road, straightforward chap, uh, you apply for Oxford, you have that extra term that I seem to remember yes. we used to have to do the Oxford exam, yes. and you roll up at Balliol, feeling you're the 11th in the family to do so. I didn't know that at the time. But, so but, there yes. wasn't a sense of entitlement. You weren't a... I didn't feel that at the time, no. Um, I, I suppose I first met it when the porter said, ah, yes, sir, Mr Dawkins, I remember your three brothers. But he meant my father and his two brothers. It was a sort of t- time must have been telescoped in, in his mind. You went to boys' schools. I, I went to a co-educational school for my second school after this. So when I arrived at Oxford, um, I was familiar with girls. Not that there were that many, because there were many fewer girls than boys at Oxford in those days. But I do remember that uh, my contemporaries at Oxford, who had been at uh, boys' schools, either boys' grammar schools or public schools, um, looked at the females as though they were a a, a very different, exotic, sometimes exciting, often alarming species. Now, you're a few years older than me. Was that your I'm afraid that's true. Yes, I think we did. Yes. What was your, did you have, can you remember your first girlfriend? I was very shy. I I hardly had girlfriends at Oxford. I, I, I was, I desperately wanted to, but I, I really was too shy to, 
to make the necessary advances. Oh, I'm sorry to hear yes. that, because um, you missed out on some fun. Well, yes. So who was eventually your first girlfriend? Oh, I, I wouldn't like to... You don't need to name names, but see, try and in your mind y- yes. picture this person. As I, as I ask you the question, I can picture... Now you talk about the, the not having the nerve. I can picture somebody whose name, I promise you, I have not thought for about 55 years, who was called Venetia. Um, no, nothing happened because I didn't dare make any move. Yes. So I'm suddenly sharing that, which I hadn't thought about until this moment. Can you picture somebody in your head? Yes, I can. I mean, um, I can picture one or two. Um, there was one who, who was actually Swedish, um, and um, I, I formed a ludicrous sort of fantasy of, of being madly in love, which I, with hindsight, of course, I wasn't. I mean, just, just, I, w- I was in love with the idea of being in love and, and romantic poetry and, and things like that. So were you reading poetry? What were the first poets you liked? Oh, well, under the influence of my father, um, A. Hausman, uh, W.B. Yeats, uh, Rupert Brooke. Um, yes, people, they're, they're, those are a good, a good three to do. Good three choices. Yes. What was the first novel you remember reading and read? Um, P.G. Woodhouse, probably. Very good. Good mm. choice. Yes. Uh, and the first serious book? Um... Did you read Evelyn War? When oh, you yes. Yes. Definitely. I adore Evelyn War. Yeah. Yes. In what, I think it wasn't a very, not a very nice man, perhaps, but, but a brilliantly sensitive. I mean, such a wonderfully sensitive observer of humanity, which he, apparently is, as a person he absolutely wasn't or, or posed as the, as the opposite. Was pop music part of your childhood? Yes, later, uh, 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 in my teens. Yeah. I, I loved... Elvis Presley in my teens, and then the Beatles later. Oh, very good. Mm. Uh, the first pop record I bought was something called He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. I remember that, yes. Um, some, Laurie London. This name, these are names that come from nowhere. You're, yes. you're taking me down memory lane now. Yes. Uh, and I would sing it, um, not realising it was a sort of spiritual. He's got the whole world in his hands. We're talking about the Lord. Yes. Um, I, I thought it was the hero. I thought, as I sang, I thought it meant me. Yes. He's got the whole world in his well, hands. Well, I had a moment of revelation when I discovered that Elvis was religious and, 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 I, and that really reinforced such religion as I had um, in a big way. Uh, you would have been brought up, as I was, a conventional Church of England. Yes. And at school, there would have been chapel. Yes. And you went, and how, what what was your feeling about all that? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, um, I I was pretty devoted and, you know, I got confirmed and went to communion and things. Later on, I I rebelled against it. And in fact, I took up not going to chapel. And I I would... Oh, why was it at school? So that early on? Well, well, not that early, maybe when I was about 17. Yeah. Uh, and um, I just didn't go. And, and, and was that acceptable? Did they? No, I don't think it was. I mean, I, I, they, they didn't actually apprehend me, but um, I, I heard afterwards that they were. Um, I, I, they think my housemaster actually talked to my parents about it and asked them to intervene. And when did it become a serious issue for you? I mean, about then. About then, mm. and it stayed a serious issue. You thought? Yes, I suppose so. Yes. Oh. Because I, I mean, I went through exactly the same experience as you, became less interested as the years went by, but still have a sentimental, romantic attachment to the rituals of the Church of England, uh, the hymns, the Book of Common Prayer. Yes. Is all that, would you regard that as dangerous? Not at all, no. I, I mean, I, I regularly play hymns on my little musical instrument and, and um, I found anything I can play. <laughs> what is your little... Speaker? Well, it's called the Iwi. It's an electronic wind instrument. It's, a, it's, it's like a... It's like an oboe or a clarinet or a flute or something. You, you play it like a woodwind instrument, but, but the noise that comes out is electronically generated and therefore it's, it can sound like a trumpet or a violin or a cello or a tuba, whatever you tell it to, to but, but you play it like a clarinet or an oboe. How wonderful. You've got, it's got an E-wee. E-wee, e wee yes, E W I. Um, you, you, can, you can play it like a clarinet or an oboe. But it can sound like a violin or a cello, complete with a wonderful vibrato, and it, it really does... You know how long it takes to play a violin to pr- produce anything like a decent sound? But with an ewe, it's decent right from the start. 
I never, I played the cello, never successfully. Um, I became obsessed with the teacher's wig. He was a man called Mr. Reed, and he had a, um, a sort of toupee. And uh, as he played more vigorously, the yes, toupee, yes, began, yes. yes, he began to jump yes. up and down and gradually move over his forehead. Just explain to people who are not familiar with the great advantage we think we were given when we went to Oxford of the tutorial system, how it worked. What was the tutorial system? Okay, well, um, in my time in zoology, uh, we were sent to a tutor each week and told to write an essay by the tutor. In those days, they read it out. Nowadays, they tend to hand it in. Um, and um, the tutor would listen and criticise, comment, uh, and then we discuss the the um, essay and the subject and then be given a, a reading list for next week and come back again. So it was a wonderful experience to be given the opportunity to become almost a world authority on a, on a very narrow subject because going into the library and reading the original research literature, you became possibly the most recent person to read up that literature in detail. And in some cases, that meant that you knew more about it than the tutor uh, because he or she hadn't read it for but some years, perhaps. Um, and that was a very good experience. That that it, It's different from sort of textbook learning where you have to sort of mug up the whole su subject around a, 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 to a topic. Um, it is narrow. You become an expert on just one very narrow topic each week, and then next week it's a different very narrow topic. But the experience of becoming an expert in a topic, however narrow, uh, I think is educationally valuable, possibly equips you to become an expert later on in life when you, you're required to read up a topic and become an expert in it. Can you give us an example of the kind of essay that you would have been set, the kind of subject? All right, then, something extremely narrow, um, as a zoologist, um, starfish have a, a, an amazing hydraulic system. They have piped seawater running in pipes all through the body. And this piped seawater functions as the blood, but it also functions as a hydraulic system for controlling the tube feet, which is what, how starfish pull themselves around. They have little, little um, projections with little, little suckers on the end which they, which they move around and then they pull themselves a, along with it. They also have um, things called pedicillary, little, little kind of tiny claws. And these also are manipulated hydraulically. So it's just like a, um, a hydraulic system on a tractor that, 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 you, that works by hyd hydraulic pressure. Well, I was given an essay on that narrow topic for one whole week and I suppose, well, I, I, I felt I, I slept and dreamt about this. It became part of my, my life for, one, for that one week. My, my brain was filled with this wonderful notion of seawater pumping through the body and, and being used hydraulically to move these little tiny organs. Well, that's not of any use to anybody. I mean, I, I, you can't use your knowledge of the starfish hydraulic system in later life. But the experience of, of learning about something as so amazing as that, nevertheless so, so narrow as that, is something that I value greatly. The intellectual satisfaction of that experience is obviously something that's informed your whole life. Yes. What is before that, the first time you think you were truly happy? Do you remember happiness as part of your childhood? Oh, yes, most of the time, actually, as a... As a, a well, perhaps not so much at school, but 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 at home. At home, yes. And what was it that made you happy at home? Just being there, feeling easy. Well, being, being in a loving family and having plenty of interesting things to do, um, having interesting parents to to talk to and and to tell me things. Was there any unhappiness? Remember unhappy moments? I think being sent away to boarding school at the age of seven, I, I would probably classify as. Uh, I mean. I used to fantasise at the Eagle School that the matron would turn into my mother, that, that kind of thing. Um, I think at my prep school we fantasised that the matron would turn into something quite other than our mothers, but maybe we're a bit older. I, don't know. <laughs> I do remember Bowden, 
who was in my dormitory. I can hear him still. He was only six when he came to the boarding school. And I do remember listening to him falling asleep crying. Crying, yes. Most nights, yeah. which was pretty grim. Yes. Do you remember your first row, the first argument you had? No. Good. Maybe, maybe you put it out of your mind. Yes. Um, I would probably... I could scratch around and try to think of something, but I can't for the no, moment. But that's good also. Mm -hmm. I, I remember years ago I had a, an operation and the surgeon said to me afterwards, now, don't have you told your wife about this? I said, yes, she brought me here, just taking me home. He said, well, apart from her, have you told your children? I said, no. He said, well, don't tell your children. Don't tell anybody. I said, why? He said, because if you don't tell anybody, you'll forget about it more quickly. And if you do tell people, they will see you now as a wounded animal. Gosh. And interestingly, uh, I went more recently to see the doctor and I was asked, you know, fill in this thing. And uh, I, I'd, I'd forgotten that I'd had this major operation all those years ago, simply because he'd said to me, it's not a good thing to advertise this. So maybe you have a capacity for forgetting bad things or for eliminating, drawing a line under them and moving on. When you think about it, the number of things we do remember is extremely small. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, I mean, I mean, is that for, you're saying that as fact, are you? Well, I, I, I can't just substantiate it, but, but it almost must be fact, mustn't it? Because there's there almost, I mean, millions and millions of things we could remember and clearly don't until something triggers it. Um, and, I mean, I, I've written a couple of autobiographies and, and it, the, the things that I put in are a pretty random collection of memories strung together. Um, if you keep a diary, I suppose it's a bit, it's a bit different. You don't. I keep a diary. I don't. And also, I have a, a room at home that is, which has a wall of boxes as long as this quite long wall to our side here, full of for each year of of everything, notes, letters. Oh, I'm the opposite of that. Okay. Oh, yes. really? Yes. You don't keep any of that. Hardly. Well, I'm not not deliberately. I mean, I'm I'm not a good thrower away, but 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 I I don't have it systematically arranged. So you're three years at Balliol. Are you doing other things outside of the academic? Are you are you not a lot? I mean, I didn't I didn't row much to the the, the distress of my grandfather, who thought there was nothing better than rowing, nothing else to do at, at Oxford but row. Um, and I didn't play sports. Uh, no, I don't think I did really have any other occupation. So what was your ambition? then, having had this interesting intellectual I stimulus. don't recall having very much of an ambition. I, towards the end of my time at Oxford, I decided I would like to stay on and do research, and, and thank goodness I was able to do so. Um, but I didn't, I've never had a long-term a long -term ambition to be a doctor or anything like that. Did you get a first? No, I, didn't get it. I got an upper second. I just was just good enough to scrape in to do research, and, yeah. then, and then thank goodness for that, because then... I, I, and what was the research you did? Well, it was with Nico Tinbergen, who, who was a very distinguished biologist, yet ended up getting a Nobel Prize. It was about choice behaviour in, in chicks, and I broadened it out to, to lots of other animals, including the members of three or four of America's leading orchestras. Um, we we'll explain this. <laughs> it was some, I, I, had, I had a mathematical model of, of how decisions are made when you have a choice. And it started out with baby chicks choosing whether to peck at green things or blue things or red things. And um, my mathematical model was very successful. What did they choose? Uh, green things? Well, well, that, that's not the point. The, po the point was the, the, the mathematical ratios with which they, they, cho they right. chose things. Um, and having done it on chicks, I then decided to look for it on other um, data. And I found in the literature data on com preferences for composers by the members of four of America's leading orchestras. And I was able to put those data into the computer and test whether these orchestral musicians behaved like chicks, which they did. How interesting. So, I mean, do we all behave in the same way? Then? Well... Uh, if we offered a choice of three, on the whole, you could predict... It's a very simple thing. If, if, if you have um, three things, A, B and C, and, and you prefer A to B and B to C... Naturally enough, you also prefer A to C. But the question is, if you know the proportion of choice from A to B and B to, to C, can you predict the, the, the proportional choice of A to C? And um, my, my mathematical model made that prediction, which worked for chicks and then worked for musicians. 
Well, that was that was a bit of a eureka moment, wasn't it for you? You thought, yes, it was satisfying. It was satisfying, but yeah. obviously very narrow and, and, and limited in scope. But it was satisfying. But it was a QED moment. It was a QED moment, yes. So that was satisfying. Yeah. Pretty satisfying to, to plot a scatter diagram of observed preference for, as it were, Mozart over Beethoven against predicted, um, and and all the points falling incredibly closely along a, along a straight line. That that was very satisfying. Yeah, to find we're all chickens after all. Yes, is just amazing. Uh, before we leave Oxford, you said that you were shy, but eventually a girlfriend did appear. Well, quite a few eventually, oh, yes. Oh, oh, so having been a, um, a wilting. Well, no, I don't know if I became... mean, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Just, just as fairly standard for a, somebody in their early twenties. Very good. Mm-hmm. And can you remember the first girlfriend? You don't need to name names, but no, I, I, sort of I, person I, that she I'm was. not sure I would actually um, talk about a girlfriend that was just friends who were girls and and who. Um, well, behave, you know, I'd run behave like girlfriends. But that's interesting because I could be very specific about it. Well, because I keep all these boxes. And rather embarrassingly, when I was doing my childhood memoir, I had the correspondence with every girl who ever wrote, replied to one of my... No one ever initiated a letter, you can be sure of that. But they, when some of them courteously replied, I've kept all the letters. And when I was writing this memoir, I got in touch with one or two of the more serious ones... Um, not serious people, but serious yeah, girlfriends, yeah. to say, you know, I've got these letters and would it be all right if I quoted here and there? And do you have anything? And they were all completely bemused. They said we threw them away at the time. I mean, yes. grief. Who do you think you are? Yes. Why would we keep your <laughs> love letters? So um, I have no letters. You have that. no letters no, of no. any kind. No. And not much recollection because I could name them in order. And if I consulted my diary, I could give you the number of days weeks, or in some cases, months, that the relationship lasted. Well, I couldn't do that. I mean, I, I could give you some names. I, I, I won't give you any names. No, you names. don't. I mean, I'm, I'm not asking the names. No. I'm just asking, really, what is interesting is how different people have different yes. uh, recollections of... Um, so you were becoming less shy, clearly more confident. You were doing your research. Did you have a picture of what the long-term future was going to be? Not really, no. I, 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 towards the end of my time of my doctorate, I started to aspire to an academic life. And then rather unexpectedly, I was invited to go to Berkeley in California as a very junior assistant professor. This happened because I presented a talk at a conference of, bio, of, of behavioral biologists, ethologists at, in Zurich. And I had a a, I was talking about the, the, the work on the chicks that I was telling you about and, 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 the, and the musicians, and I built a, a sort of Heath Robinson piece of apparatus um, to, to behave like a chick or like an orchestral mu- musician, um, instantiating the model with mercury bouncing up and down in a tube and electron sparks flying and, and lights flashing and noises going off. And um, this was... This appealed to the audience. It was a, it was a piece of Heath Robinson apparatus that were sort of rather br- brought the house down. And um, as a result of this talk that I gave, I was approached by a professor at the University of California saying, would you like to come and be an assistant professor at Berkeley? Um, and uh, I was rather flattered by this. I mean, not normally you have to apply and, and, you know, go up for interview and things. And I was just invited to go. So I said yes, and so I went to Berkeley for two years. Well, it, it, potentially for the whole ca- career, but I actually stayed there two years. And did you find you were a good teacher? It's not for me to say. Uh, I, um, I think I probably was slightly unusual in that I, um, I presented stuff which was as it was possibly a result of the Oxford tutorial system, th- things that I had been reading up on quite r- lately and which were rather new and were not, not in the textbooks. And so I think um, I'm not sure whether, how well that went down, but, but I, I'm quite pleased to have done that. And this was in 1966. 
And in a couple of the lectures at Berkeley, I essentially laid out the basis for what later became my first book, The Selfish Gene, 10 years later. So that was an, an, an early um, uh, launching of, of that material. And did you then have in mind that you were going to be writing a book? Because The Selfish Gene no, I didn't. is what changes no, your I didn't. life. No, I, I, I didn't know I was going to write a book. And th that came much later. But, th but those two lectures in, in Berkeley, um, when I think back on them, that I even have the notes on that, um, they, they, self they, they use exactly the same rhetoric as I was later to use in The Selfish Gene. Now you've mentioned it, why do you think The Selfish Gene became as it did? It changed your life. It became an international bestseller, sold more than a million copies, 25 different translations all over the world, made you famous. Uh, why did it? Why did that happen? I, I say that because I, I think at the same sort of time, uh, Desmond Morris published The Naked Ape. That was which, a little bit earlier, yes. yes. Which was hugely popular. It yes. was popular science. Yes. You were doing something quite... I, and I can, I can see why that became a success. Yes. So why did The Selfish Gene, which isn't so obvious, become such a success? Well, in the preface to The Selfish Gene, I wrote that it should be read almost as though it was science fiction, but it's science fact. Um, I think I adopted what sounded a little bit like science fiction and almost surreal approach to the animal, treating the animal, calling the animal a survival machine, um, calling the animal a robot programmed by its genes to survive and pass on the genes that did the programming. So the, the, the animal is, is, a, is a robot. It contains genes which make it do things that cause it to survive and reproduce. And the very same genes that, made it, that did the programming consequently survive and go on to the next generation. So I had this slightly science fiction-y vision of genes as immortal passing down through indefinite numbers of millions of years, casting aside a succession of mortal throwaway bodies. Well, that's a, a, a vision of life which is, doesn't contradict anything which is known to be true and is in the textbooks, but that kind of vision is not in the textbooks. Well, it is now, but, but, but it, it, that, that kind of vision... Um, possibly caught people's imagination in the same kind of way as science fiction catches the imagination, although so it's actually fact. You were observing what was already there, but in a new way. Exactly. And it was controversial because there were people, there were some people who hated Darwin when he came along and didn't believe any of that. And yes, I mean, there, there are people who hated Darwinism, but, but more, of, in my case, there were people who hated the idea... They misunderstood it as what they call genetic determinism, they, the, the idea that we are slaves to our genes and so we, we, you can't be blamed if you're aggressive or, or, or an un, unpleasant character because you're selfish, because your genes are selfish, that, that kind of thing. I, I think a lot of people, perhaps read the book by title only, um, were incensed at the idea that I was propagating or, or advocating selfishness. So your first... What is your first thought about what you have achieved, first of all through the selfish gene and through your work? What, what, what have you been looking to achieve? Oh, um, well, you were saying earlier about um, taking the facts and presenting them in another way mm -hmm. and uh, in, almost on, on their head. I think it's probably fair to say that now most people think, what is the animal doing that is preserving its genes for lo in, the, in the long term? Mm. It's one of the satisfactions is that you have informed um, the next generations. Yes, I mean, you're asking me to be more immodest than I want to be, but, but um, I suppose there is an element of that. Well, it's nice. Yes. It's, it's good. You want to feel that your life has been worthwhile. Everyone wants to feel that. Yeah. Well, no, I think some people are just happy to bumble along. Yes. But I think you should feel it. Well, another friend of mine, uh, Susie Dent, with whom I do a podcast all about words and language, said, this is thrilling for you to meet this man because he's one of the few people in the world that we know gave a word to the world. Uh, the word meme. She said, ask him about that. Oh, dear. Tell me about the word meme, how you originated it, 
And isn't it phenomenal that it's a, a global world? Well, the selfish gene is all about um, the gene as being in the unit of selection. Natural selection is all about the differential survival of genes, meaning DNA in, in gene pools. But I, in the last chapter, I wanted to make the point that Darwinism will work anywhere in the universe where there is self-replicating information, um, copying, self-copying, where uh, the, the self-copying entity becomes more numerous in the pool if it's good at doing what it does, whatever that might be. It doesn't have to be DNA. It could be anything that is self-copying and which has power over its own probability of being copied. And we could go to other planets and find out what the replicators are there, but it's in practice difficult to go to other planets. Maybe I said we could look on this planet and see another replicator that is beginning its course of evolution. The meme is the unit of cultural inheritance. So something like a, a clothes fashion, a fashion of speech, a fashion, a tune, a, a, a school craze it spreads like an epidemic, a craze for a particular kind of toy, a craze for a particular a habit, a particular habit of speech. Um, awesome is a, is a, is a meme which, which spreads. Everybody uses the word awesome just when they mean something vaguely worthy of approval. It's, it's, it's lost its meaning. Um, it's a meme that's, that spreads. Um, a, a clothes fashion like, like the back but baseball cap is a, is, a, is a meme that spreads by imitation. Uh, the word basically, which, um, it, which, can't, which appears in almost every sentence of pe people of a certain age, um, it doesn't mean, basically it doesn't mean any more than er uh or um. um. And it spreads as a, as a meme. It becomes a habit. It becomes a, a kind of a positioner in, in a sentence. Um, so... If these self-replicating entities, things that spread through the human meme pool by imitation, if some of them are more successful at spreading than others, then that is a primitive form of Darwinian selection. Uh, whether it gives rise to interesting evolution is another matter, and that's a subject for memeticists to investigate. Wonderful. Well, I still think it's very exciting to meet someone who has changed the language as well as changed the discourse of science, which is good. Um, and clearly, to me, you don't seem controversial at all. I, I was talking to my friend Richard Harris, the bishop, former oh, yes. bishop of Oxford, who's known you, and I think you've taken part in debates. Delightful man, yes. Uh, he is delightful. Yes. And he said you were delightful. Um, and what do you, where are you on people having disagreements? Because he's a man of faith, and you're a man of science, and... Uh, uh, well, well I, I like to think I'm a I'm a civil and polite dis disagreeer, yes. and and, and um, I enjoy the company of of people of people like Richard Harris and and, um, uh, and I've I mean the, the bishops that I've ever met have all been delightful people and and um, uh, wonderful to get on with. So you don't think they're living in a fool's paradise? They're living in their own paradise, but they're not necessarily fools. Well, they're not fools. Um, uh, I mean, I, th I think their paradise is 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 an illusory one, but but um, certainly not f not fools. You, you're feeling good on them if that's the way they want to be. Yes. Yeah. What was your first encounter with a serious illness? I suppose it was when I had a stroke in 2016, uh, and. Um, uh, it, it was um, a, a very strange sensation. I, I became aware that I couldn't properly control my hands. I, I, I was not able to um, pick things up or, or let go of them. And um, so I um, immediately realised, I think, that I was having a stroke and, and I, was, I, I, I telephoned a friend and and was picked up he 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 got the ambulance round and they took me to, to the hospital and and I was very well looked after at the John Ratcliffe hospital in oxford and um i seemed to have made a recovery well you've made a remarkable recovery one wouldn't know for a moment were you for a while incapacitated with not really no i i i was only for about 2 days and then um i had physiotherapy I'm not sure how much I needed that. 
um, I'm probably a, a bit less good at things like standing on one leg. You said you went, you were tightrope walking as a child. I, I, I would be, if I ever was able to tightrope walk, I probably couldn't now. And I can't now. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've taken, I've got to the stage when I'm falling over. I've fallen over three times. And I'm now doing physio, and I'm spending a lot of time trying to stand on one leg and then on the other leg. Yes. It's a nightmare. Yes. I mean, are, are you fearful of death? Are you accepting of it? I'm accepting of it. I mean, it, 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 after all, it's exactly the same as before birth. Um, I, I want to go on living because I enjoy life a lot, and I feel I've got a lot of things to do in life. Um, but actually being dead. I think it was Mark Twain who said, I was dead for billions of years before I was born and never suffered the smallest inconvenience. <laughs> and and I, I think that's the right attitude. Another attitude that I've cultivated myself is to say that the only thing that's frightening about death is the idea of eternity. And eternity is a frightening concept, and therefore it's probably best spent under a general anaesthetic, <laughs> which is what's going to happen. Can I ask, what's the first thing you do in the morning? Oh, log into the computer. Oh, really? Even yes. before breakfast? Even before you get your mug of tea? Yes. Yeah. Oh, really? My yes. gosh. Mm. And what's the last thing you do at night? Same thing. Really? Just yeah. check. But that's not supposed to be You're not supposed to have a look at screens. I know, I know. It's very bad. What is the first thing you would like people to think of when they hear your name? A scientist, lover of the truth, and... Um, motivated by a desire to communicate truth to other people. I think you haven't done badly in our conversation. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends and leaving a review.